Um, but thank you all for joining me for Zoom into Archaeology. Uh, my name is Nicole Grenan. I'm a public archaeologist with the Florida Public Archaeology Network's Northwest region, which is located here in Pensacola, Florida. And I'm so happy to be joined today by Nigel Rudolph, who is the public archaeologist in FPAN's central region. Um, and if you've been to a Zoom into Archaeology talk with us before, thank you. If not, I'm glad you're here for the first time. Um, what we're going to do today, since it's going to be a fairly small group, we're going to record this so that we can put it on our YouTube channel for people who weren't able to join us today so that they can watch the, the documentary and then maybe get a little inside information from Nigel about, about the project at the end. Um, and, you know, with Zoom Talks, we'll just keep our microphones off while the documentary running. That way we cut down on background noise. And if anyone has any questions or has a point for discussion that they want to bring up at the end of the presentation, um, you know, you can feel free to put that in the chat box while the documentary is playing. Um, so Nigel, if it's okay with you, I'll let you introduce yourself a little bit and maybe sure. how this project got started. Sure. Hi, Sarah and Shelby. Good to meet, see everybody. <laughs> see all two of you. Um, so this project kind of was accumulation of several years of working with communities in Archer, Florida, which if you're not familiar with uh, Archer, it's just about 20 minutes west of Gainesville, um, sort of between uh, Gainesville and Rosewood. Um, you're familiar with the Rosewood massacre. Um, and Archer is a little railroad town that is very similar to Gainesville. Um, it was very similar to Gainesville. It was a stop on David Levy Uli's um, railroad going from Cedar Key to Fernandina Beach. Um, and but Archer did exist prior to Uli coming. Um, but when Uli came through, he basically created the Archer that we see now. And he also built a giant plantation called Cottonwood Plantation. Um, and so many of the enslaved people that were working in the Cottonwood Plantation, as well as plantations uh, around Archer and closer into Gainesville that were run by the Hale family, if you're familiar with the historic Hale homestead, which is amazing. Um, uh, there was a lot of plantations in that area. And in turn, there was a lot of enslaved people in that area. Um, and so what happened after emancipation is a lot of those enslaved people stayed. Um, they stayed and they built a community, a viable community in the area, and they they needed burials. Um, the first burial of uh, at the Bethlehem Methodist Episcopal Cemetery that we feature at the end of the um, at the end of the documentary was 1879. Um, but we do believe that people were getting buried in that area well before emancipation; that the slaves were bringing their deceased. Um, and to be buried in that area. It's still a relatively rural area. Um, I've been working with that cemetery for about three years, four years now, actually, working with them on, on uh, doing a lot of restoration work. We have, we've been working with the University of Florida, Historic Preservation Department, um, and just really doing some really amazing stuff. Um, now, the other cemetery that's sort of the prime cemetery that's being featured in the documentary is called St. Peter Cemetery, and that's on the north side of Archer, which is real, actually an unincorporated Archer. Um, so it's technically not in the city of Archer, I started working with that community, the, um, it's called the uh, St. Peter St. Paul Community Council, which was a bit of a, a church-based activist group that was put together um, to help stop a development of a large-scale um, solar power plant that was coming in that was going to disturb the cemetery and the community. Um, the folks in Alachua County uh, County Commission, as well as the people that were running the solar power plant, seemed to have no idea that there was a black community there for 150 years and they wanted to just stick a massive i mean it was like 500 acres of solar power uh, solar array which would have been a massive like um they would have had to put a substation in and just like crazy crazy stuff so they asked me to to get involved and um to uh, to update the florida master site file um i have found five cemeteries, including St. Peter, um, that have been mislabeled on the Florida Master site file as white when they are actually about 99% African American, only in Alachua County. Um, and St. Peter was one of them. And so that was a big part of what got me involved with the community. Um, 
and just like both cemeteries and just like the whole uh, African American community in Archer um, all around, it's just been just been so wonderful get to, to get to meet these folks and to, to, to hear their stories and and to understand their connection to the landscape. They've been they've been involved with that area for a very, very, very long time. Um, and and, and um, I'm, that goes on to more detail in the um, in the documentary, but one of the people that are buried at um, at Bethlehem Methodist, she was kidnapped at age 12 in 1829 and forced march from um, Jackson, Mississippi to Archer, Florida in a coffle. If you're familiar with that, um, a coffle is basically a chained um, march. They were chained at the neck and at the feet and they had to march from Jackson, Mississippi. Um, she was separated from her family, sisters died, just terrible situation. And she is buried at the Bethlehem Methodist Episcopal Cemetery. So that's just a fraction of the history, the powerful history that's uh, being um, seen in these, what we call um, outdoor museums, which are historic cemeteries. That was a really long introduction, sorry. No, that, was <laughs> that was a great primer for what we're gonna see. So I'll go ahead and share my screen here and we'll get started. If anyone has any issues with the audio or anything, just sing out and let me know that you're having trouble hearing. Um, we did an audio check before, but that doesn't always catch everything. <laughs> so you should see the black screen. Well, one thing about a cemetery, it pretty much have a lot of history in it. If you just take time to go out and study it, um, because the headstone says a lot. And if you want to find out about a person, you have an idea, putting a headstone up, it can tell you a lot about your family history, as well as the history of the community. It says a lot and, and it tells you the history of the, of the, the way you maintain a place and tell you the history of that community by the appearance of it. This is a, um, a place where when you're living, you have a voice, but once you're dead, you don't have a voice. And if you love a person the way you say you love them, once they're dead, you also love them. And, and the way to show that you love them is maintaining your burial plots, because it's very important to maintain it because if you don't do it, no one else is. What's going on here today is we have, the state have come in and helped help preserve headstones that have been left unattended by family members down through the years. My personal connection is, um, this is all I know. I was born in this area, right down the road from here, in fact. And my father attended this church. My mother attended Pinesville. And so once they married, then she became a part of this church. So this neighborhood has been in my life all the days of my life. And uh, my parents are buried here. My grandparents are buried here. And I have a great grandfather that was buried here. And uncles and aunts. I have an uncle that was in World War I. Um, so this is home. Everything is sacred. If you would take a broader look into something, uh, it may not be to this person, but it is to someone. And so I think they need to take that under consideration by educating the community and the families that are, you know, what you have is important. 
And when I wrote my book in the book that's called uh, Alachua County, Florida, when I wrote that book, I had gone to all seven cemeteries and I located 28 enslaved women and men. Mr. Thomas Rowling was born, I'm thinking, I believe in 1884. And from 1884 to 1865, I was able to locate 28 black uh, pioneers. St. Joseph is the oldest community in Alachua County, the oldest. And of course they were brought to Archer also by slave masters. It is all rooted in enslavement. However, when we buried our people, we buried them in the same cemetery. Most of these cemeteries were originated at a church. Okay, in Pinesville, I, I am responsible for that sign, that road sign that says Pinesville, because after I done my research and presented it to Bill Power, then people got interested. Where is Pinesville? They had never heard of Pinesville. And when I did my research at Pinesville, that was my second site I researched because when I was in high school, they closed the school in Pinesville. And the children from that area, from the St. Peter Pinesville area, migrated three or four miles to Archer High School, Archer Negro Public School, where I attended. And I knew if the kids came from there, I knew there must have been a church there. And it was. In this cemetery, I have my great-grandmother and grandfather, both sides of my family. My mother and my father is buried here. I have a lot of aunts and uncles and, and, and cousins that are out here now. And so, and maybe, hopefully one day this will be my final resting place as well. This site is, is the home of some, most, some of the most amazing people that I will probably ever meet in my lifetime. Uh, these people's names were never up in neon lights, but they don't have to be up in neon lights to be amazing people. These are the people here that has taught us great worth ethics. I know you probably heard that saying that can make a dollar out of 15 cents. These are the people right here that coined that phrase. They took what they had and they made it work. And, and they taught us how to work. They taught us how to love one another. They taught us the sense of what real community is supposed to be. And so it is very special to me because I can always come out here and, and reminisce and share memories as I was just a few minutes ago, sharing some memories of some of the people that are out here. And, and that's what makes this place a very, very special place to me. I think one of the biggest threats outside of big business is people who are sitting in places, in high places and seats, that has no real sense of what this community means to us, what it's all about, and they, they are making decisions that shapes us, but doesn't know anything about this community. You, you cannot get the sense of a community by just taking a drive through a few minutes and determining, oh, well, these people here are not close people, they're not, which is absolutely false. And I think that's the part of the problem is big business now it's coming into areas that once was never attracted to them. Now it's very attractive because they're running out of space in other places. And so they come in with big ideas and, and, and flashing a few dollars. And, and people who are sitting in places to make those decisions are making decisions that affects us and it has nothing to do with them. They don't live in this community. They know anything about the community. And so I think that's one of the biggest threats that we face here keep up with the change in laws so you'll know what's in effect and what's not in effect. And the most part about it is get involved, get it out there, let people know where these places are and what you are doing to preserve them. Our family history is buried here. My grandmother, grandfather, uh, my dad, I have sisters, my mom. So this has been our family cemetery since I can remember. Uh, my grandfather was born out here in 1901, and his mother was born out here during uh, the latter part of slavery. So, you know, they're all here. Talk to your elders. Listen to what they're saying. 
record it, write it down. Um, because that's a wealth of knowledge and sometimes they don't want to talk about the history. They don't want to talk about the past because it's so painful. But it's important for the younger generation to know this history moving forward because um, as, as you can see, there's laws that are being uh, 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 discussed and, and things written into laws to try to not talk about it or erase it. So it's like you move forward in one respect and then you move backwards in another. But if communities stick together and continue these dialogues about the, the community, about the history of the community, how rich that community history is to preserve it, um, uh, that's I think would be, that's the most important thing that we could ever do, ever do. My personal connection to this sacred place is my elders, my mom, my dad, my granddaddy, his daddy, his mom, and it goes way back. And I'm sitting inside my husband's grave for 56 years, and our son is next to him. And then my dad is right in the other aisle, Aaron Rollins. And my granddad that was born in 18, 90 and died in 1984. He fought in World War I. And all of those sacred people has been planted in this area. So it's very sacred to me, not only them, but so many other relatives. Who knows what's next? Somebody is trying to plan. I don't know, but I hope it's nothing that will harm our sacred place and let our loved ones rest in peace and not disturb it. I would like the general public to know that these places are special. Because of just, you know, society, because of um, how slavery kind of didn't allow for the history of enslaved people and their descendants to be documented, that if you can find a place where the families are still here, several generations later, that's special. I would like the general public to know, one, we're here. You know, there's a little place called Archer, Pinesville, St. Peter neighborhood um, that are descendants of slaves. And we're still here. We're still contributing to society. We're still loving and honoring our relatives. I think that's something that, one, I would like the, the general public to know. events because it's good to reflect on where we came from and also to help. They're important. History is important, so it's, you know, important to preserve these. I would say because all I ever known was this cemetery. This is my home. I live in the back, back in the back of the cemetery here. And this is my home, and this is where all my family is penalized. So I would say it's a special touch to me. I love it. I enjoy coming out in the cemetery and looking and try to help keep it up. We are, to me, it's a lovely community. We all um, get along together real close out here and loving, and uh, whenever anybody need anything, the people are here to, to assist and help you. And uh, Gainville, Archer, uh, John, uh, St. Peter, all, all the communities are just together. Whenever anything happens, they are there for each other, to assist each other. So my personal connection to this place is like I stated, I'm the great, great granddaughter of Major Reddick who owned the property here. And there was a church, he was the pastor of the church and he gave the land to the community for a community cemetery. And my property is adjacent 
as well to the cemetery. Especially in the last, I would say, maybe 10 years, we've done a lots of cleanups. Uh, we now have UELF and other people helping to preserve the history. We have a website. Uh, we're getting ready to do a fence around the property. We have information. So we're, we're doing what we can to preserve it. In the past, I've been with some African-Americans when they see their ancestors' grave for the first time. It's a very emotional experience. So, and there's a reason for that emotion. Finding these places and preserving these places and telling the stories of these people is something that's very important to understanding our history. African-American cemeteries were not on the Florida Master Site Fall. And I had been to enough FPAN crypt workshops and conferences to know that that's kind of like the first step puts them on the radar screen so developers and others will know the cemetery is there if there's no visible grave markers left. What I was thinking in terms of the truth and reconciliation, we need to identify all of these cemeteries and make sure that they all get put on the Florida Master Site file. Having the cemetery where your ancestors are buried, preserved, I think it anchors people give them a sense of roots and where they came from. First of all, I'd like to say that my sister, uh, Clyde Williams, who was the founder of the BMECRO, she recently passed, of course, uh, started the maintenance on the cemetery. So she wrote me a letter and she asked uh, if I would take over the project, reorganize it, raise funds to maintain it. And this is what I'm doing. Um, and I intend to carry out those goals because it meant a lot to her and it means a lot to me. Then the other connection that I have with the cemetery is that I have grandfather, grandmother, great-grandmother, great-great-great-grandfather, who is Albert McKinney. And Albert was born in 1829. He served or worked on the Cottonwood Plantation, the Yulee Plantation. And he was a blacksmith for that uh, plantation, as well as blowing the, ha the ham's horn three times a day for the slaves to get up, get up and get off and that sort of thing. A long time ago, if you really think about this place, this cemetery was established in 1875. So when you really think about this place, there were a lot of black people who tried to keep it going and maintain it. And this is the reason why the contractors and other, other developers didn't come in here and scoop us up like they did in Tampa and build buildings and whatever they do. They just couldn't just walk in here and take over without going through some of those freed slaves. And by the way, the freed slaves are the one who, ones who um, built the church here, the BMEC uh, in 1875. So, and I don't think a lot of people here know, really know that all these slaves are here. And this is why it's so important for everybody to try to protect this and preserve it. There's a saying, you've, you've got to know where you've come from in order to move forward. And that's what we need to do in Archer.
You're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> I I stop you. Thank you all again. Sorry. All right, there we go. YouTube keeps playing. Well, thank you for, for watching that with us. I, it blinked out at one point. I'm sorry. I think my computer had got a notification and then it moved it to a different desktop. So hopefully it wasn't too much of an interruption. Unbelievable. Okay. Awesome. Well, that, you know, what a great documentary and so uplifting at the end. You know, there's so much hope when there are people who care about these sites. And I think it's really encouraging to see communities like that that are out there and you know doing the hard work to protect places that are important to them but also important to the communities around them so it's such an emotional video like honestly yeah. when those two older women at the beginning in in, in saint peter's cemetery like i get literally teared up every time i and i've seen this documentary a thousand times and it's just so beautiful um because that it just like how you keep up cemeteries um um, is a reflection of how you feel about the people that were buried there, like their, their passion and emotion for um, even just talking about their ancestors is just so powerful and it's so moving to me. Um, and yeah, I mean, literally this work has been the most fulfilling work I've ever done in my career. Um, I, I absolutely love it. I absolutely love the work and love the community. It seems like they really appreciate all the everything that everyone's contributed, not just, you know, you all, but everyone else who's been a part of this project. Oh, it's, yeah, it's, it's been, a, it's been a huge, huge gathering and it's still going on. It's not like this, this um, documentary was sort of the pinnacle of it. Like, as I was saying earlier, Nicole, this documentary is sort of a mini version of one that we want to produce in the future. Um, and um, they mentioned seven, seven, there's seven African-American cemeteries in Archer. Um, alone. Um, there's like 65 in Alachua County. Um, and so we're really trying to expand this and, and bring attention to it. And people are writing grants and, you know, it's just, it's really, it's a huge community building thing. Um, and it's very powerful to see and people stand behind it. Even coming from a, an archaeologist, you know, when like I, when you're thinking about material culture, thinking about those headstones, like what, what do those mean and how do they impact people? Well, what I always talk about is that's the last vestige of, of the individuals. That's it. That's all they have left besides memories. And so it's really important to maintain those spaces. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I, I've come up with a couple of kind of softball questions for you, Nigel, I but so. I don't know if anybody else, you know, has anything they want to say or any discussion points you want to bring up, Nigel, that, you know, reflecting on it, I'm, I'm happy to ask these. I'm thinking kind of of the people who aren't here who may not know much about the topic or FPAN or work that you've done. So go for if it. There's anything else we want to talk about first, we, we can absolutely do that. Anybody have any questions? Yeah, yes, Sarah. <laughs> um, so I thought uh, like in the video, um, Michelle spoke really powerfully about trying to raise awareness from the general public uh, about these cemeteries. So I was wondering what strategies you have been incorporating that maybe weren't featured in the video or how, um, yeah, how you would approach this for all, did you say 65 cemeteries in Alachua County? Yeah, yeah, something yeah. like that. Um, Michelle Rutledge is phenomenal. Um, I met her when, uh, in reference to that that solar power plant, um, she actually lives in Maryland. She doesn't even she's from Archer, but she's a um, a pharmacist in Maryland, and so she flies down here to be with her mom. And literally, she, like her mom was born on the road that goes to Pinesville Cemetery. Um, but right now, she is uh, both both cemeteries are working on getting historical signage. Um, and, and Karen Kirkman, the historian at Historic Hale Homestead, who spoke in the documentary, who's a very close friend of mine, um, she's working on the wording um, on the, of those historical signage. So that's going into place. Um, we're just expanding the uh, attention that we're giving to these places. And, and I've had probably a dozen um, pastors have reached out to me to help start documentation of their their sacred spaces and you know we can't we can't do everything we can't get everybody um but we're going to try our hardest to expand it looks like we've got a good question Thank from you. shelby 
Mm -hmm. Could you read that again? I didn't quite get a chance. You want me to read it to you? Yeah. I think. Yeah. So Shelby's asking if, well, like um, if you know anyone from Laurel Hill Cemetery near or in Archer, um, she had emails with Joyce Lewandowski. I hope I said that right. Um, in 2018 <laughs> and referred her to FPAN and the Lachio County Historical Commission? Um, I don't. Um, Laurel Hill, I believe, is right down the street from um, Bethlehem Methodist Episcopal Cemetery. Um, so I, I have been there. Um, I, there's so many I tend to get confused um, about where they're at and because uh, uh, the cemetery can tend to be, uh, or the archer is pretty rural. Um, in a lot of ways still, but no, I haven't, I haven't been contacted by them or anything, but I'm happy if you want to tell them to reach out again, um, uh, I would be happy to, to touch base with them and, and see what we can do to help preserve the space or, you know, do our best to, you know, document it. Um, that's the, that's one of the biggest problems is, is, is preservation is one thing, right? Preservation is one thing, but documentation is the basic bare minimum that of, of uh, something we can offer um, and um, and help them help them do that to document those on the Florida master site file um, my name is Nigel Rudolph r-u-d-o-l-p-h like the reindeer I'll see if I'll um I'll pull your email address and if you're okay I'll put it in the chat box there yeah absolutely please have have anybody and everybody reach out this is like my thing now like I'm the cemetery guy I guess and that's you know um it's um I it's not necessarily easier to manage this kind of uh information and working with uh you know these folks who are the descendants of these people that are buried. Um, it's not necessarily the easiest route as opposed to uh, pre-colonial um, Native American archaeology or other kinds of historic archaeology. Like these, there's real people. <laughs> like, I mean, there's plenty of real Native Americans, but um, that sounded bad. That's not what I meant. <laughs> but it's it's just challenging. It's a it's a very different challenge in working with descendant populations. Um, I'm sure Sarah probably could could speak to that regarding Native Americans as well down there. It's it's very different because how academics view uh, documentation and preservation is very different how descendants view documentation and preservation. Mm -hmm. um, I've been told by as many. Um, elder African Americans regarding their cemeteries that they don't want us to to stir the pot. Literally been told by that. Um, but then I've talked to younger descendants that say, "Please stir the pot." Like, and so we're sort of in this middle ground where um, we're trying to be good community stewards, um, but also be respectful of everybody's needs. And as an archaeologist, as an F painter, like I, I don't want to. Like I want to be as distant from any attention about these kinds of things besides spreading the word about the the history as best as I can. Like we we were very limited in our um, our scope on the the documentary. Um, we didn't get interviewed. Um, our names are all the way at the end. It's all about the community. We are following their wishes, um, and we they are leading the direction, and we're just utilizing what we have to offer. Um, to help them move along. So I guess that's a good lead into some of these maybe easier questions that I have for you, Nigel, as our cemetery <laughs> expert. <laughs> Just really basic questions for people who may, you know, be getting started with trying to preserve a local cemetery or, you know, um, they have something that they care about locally. Um, so my first question was the Florida Master Site File. This was something we saw mentioned in the video you know, really quickly, you don't have to go into a dissertation on it, but what is the Florida Master Site File and why does it matter for protecting and preserving historic cemeteries? Great question. Um, the Florida Master Site File is an inventory of all historic and prehistoric archaeological sites and cemeteries and structures in the entire state up in Tallahassee. So it's it's a list. It's an inventory list that Tallahassee holds, uh, the um, Division of Historical Resources. Um, they They created the Florida Master Site File to document these important historic locations, um, whether it be Native American sites, old buildings in your neighborhood, or historic cemeteries. Um, and so it's really, really important as a first step in preservation is to get Tallahassee aware that this place exists, um, to, get the, to get that on the list. And it's not, it's not hard. 
Um, and FPAN, we, in all the regions, I'm sure you all would agree, in all the regions, we are more than happy to help and um, get this, to, to make that happen, to fill out a, a site file form um, and to get that on the radar, because it is really the first step in preservation. It doesn't mean it's going to necessarily protect your, your spot, but it's certainly going to make it much more difficult for a developer to come in because they're going to know it exists. The state will know it exists. Mm -hmm. That's a, yeah, that's a good lead. You know, one of my other questions was someone who is starting from absolutely zero, you know, they know of a family cemetery or a local cemetery that should be recorded. Where can they go to get more information? It sounds like, I mean, you know, we always encourage folks to contact us. Is that what you would say to Nigel? You know, if you're just looking for someone to reach out to, to get more advice. 100%. Yeah. Reach out to us. We'll, we'll, um, uh, my job is to be the intermediary between um, uh, DHR, the Division of Historical Resources, and the public. Like we will handle all the jargon, we will handle all that stuff. You come and you tell us, and we'll we'll look up and do the research. Um, and that's the great place to start. You can also contact DHR. They're not like crazy uh, Tallahassee bureaucrats. They're really normal, wonderful people. And you can literally call them on the phone um, and, and speak to somebody there and they can help you as well. Um, but yeah, shoot me an email, anybody. And I'm more than happy to help. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And then, you know, one question, I, I think I get quite a bit up here, you know, a lot of family cemeteries, um, places that are being kept up by really passionate people, they might be using the wrong tools to do that. And so one of the things we see a lot in the video is people cleaning grave markers and, and headstones. And so my question for you is, what are they using? Why are they using it? And is, are there things that we shouldn't use to take care of these places? Well, bleach, of course. Um, and so there are right ways and wrong ways to maintain these his, this historic material culture. Um, uh, depending on the stone, marble and granite, all in concrete, even vernacular concrete stones, the absolute only thing to use is a product called D2 Biological Solution. It was invented by a dude that I just met named Norman Weiss from New York City, and I got him to sign a bottle of D2 for me. Um, <laughs> and I was super excited. Um, but yeah, soft bristle brushes um, and, and find out when the next Crypt Cemetery Resource Protection Training Workshop will be in your area. Um, or if we're doing it online, find out when that's going to happen. Uh, I, I think we're planning on doing some soon um, and, uh, and, and get that information. There, there is um, information out there, um, but a lot of places um, don't provide the correct information and that's what we'll do. Um, but yeah, never use bleach, never use wire brushes, never use uh, pressure cleaners. Um, it, when all else fails, use a soft bristle brush and water unless you can, unless you can use D2. Um, and that's, that's really the best thing to do. Mm -hmm. I'll just mention real quick, you know, Nigel's mentioned a lot of resources that the Florida Public Archaeology Network has. Um, if you go online, you can find us on our website. It's fpan.us. And from there, you should be able to um, find information on our cemetery, cemetery resources protection training, which is one of the workshops that we do, as well as some other guidance on, you know, best practices for maintaining historic cemeteries or preserving them. So, so there's lots of good resources on our website, too. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. 100%. And then I guess maybe a final question, unless anybody else has something else they'd like to bring up. Um, maybe another fairly easy question for you. Are there any current organized efforts, not, not necessarily grassroots, but at the higher level? Because you mentioned the Florida Master Site File and the Division of Historical Resources. Are there other efforts to get these places documented? Because, you know, people can be passionate and interested, but it takes time to do this kind of thing. So is there any help, you know, out there? Yes, so there, uh, the governor, our illustrious governor, um, signed into a law, I guess, a, 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 a task force. Um, and it was the African American Cemetery Task Force that went into play six months ago or so. Um, and they are looking at solutions on how to better document and um, protect these historic locations. So there is like official recognition, not grassroots only. Um, and they are winding up their um, initial look at the situation. Um, and uh, yeah, I think there's a meeting coming up 
just after the holiday. I don't have the specific information about the meeting, but it, it's all online uh, and available public for the public to view. Um, but there is official um, an official task force looking at this issue. Um, and it's not saying that, that white cemeteries aren't threatened and that um, all cemeteries of all ethnicities aren't something that are threatened, but uh, African-American cemeteries are particularly threatened because of the history of um, segregation and enslavement and the lack of uh, attention given to these communities in the history of the state. So um, they are particularly threatened and they, it demands particular attention. And that's what they're finally doing. This has been a task force that has been, this is kind of the latest, uh, <laughs> latest facet of many, many different um, attempts at this. And it looks like they got their, their feet under them and they're, they're making some headway with this uh, really important subject. That was a really another Nigel long ass answer to a really simple question. <laughs> no, it's good. It's important. It's information that I don't think a lot of people who aren't kind of in the circle of preservation or cemetery work maybe maybe don't know about it quite as much. But it's really important stuff that's happening at the state level. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, any other questions or comments or anything anyone else would like to discuss? Happy to field some of those. If not. Oh, yeah, Shelby, go ahead. I put a comment in the chat about um, asking Nigel if the next year's um, National AGS conference, they are going to have a virtual element. And I think exposing that um, video that you just showed and sharing it so that people across not only our nation, but last year, there was 2021, there were people from all over the world attending that virtual conference. And, you know, perhaps it's an opportunity for someone to see it and say, I hadn't thought about doing that for my community. And the more we make that happen, the more aware people become. I totally agree. I'm happy to help out um, uh, with that. And I'd be happy to, to do something similar to what we've done here um, for that conference. Uh, yeah, please send me all the information. I will. I'll make sure you're on the list. Thank you. And I'm going to be entering it into um, like film festivals, uh, documentary film festivals. That, again, um, just not only to highlight the subject matter, but also to just the skill. I mean, it's a really wonderfully made documentary. It's not like a student film. It's really good. <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, very professional, professionally yeah, really, done. Yeah, I was really, really impressed. <laughs> well, excellent. Um, well, thank you again, Nigel, and thank you, Sarah and Shelby, for being here today. Thank really you. appreciate it. Um, amazing work being done, and hopefully, you know, if if there's more being done, we we'll, we can touch base with you next year or the year after and talk a little bit more about this topic too, because it's so important. I would love that. I would love that. Absolutely. At the beginning, did you record so that you can post it back to the website? Uh, yes, this will be all be recorded. We're going to put it up on our YouTube channel, um, so everyone can stream it. The, the documentary actually already is up on the YouTube channel. Um, so if you go to YouTube and just search Florida Public Archaeology Network, you can find it there. But we'll post this as well to include some of the discussion that we've had here today. Give a little context and information. I saw from Facebook there were other people who said they were interested. And I know I, it, it took me a number of clicks to find the link to register. <laughs> and I did send it to someone else. So I don't know if she was able to get on or not. Yeah, Facebook hides registration links if you're not using their platform. It's like they're doing it on purpose. They are <laughs> but, uh, doing it on purpose. Oh, I'm sure they are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but yes, I will go ahead and post the link to the video once we upload it to the Facebook event that we created. And I'll post it on our, our page as well. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, of course. All right. Well, thank you all. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy holiday week, whichever holiday you're celebrating. Um, <laughs> if you have time off work, enjoy that. That's the most important part, I think. So Absolutely. It's good to see everybody. Thank you for yeah. coming on the, the talk. Thank all you right. all. Bye. Bye. Bye, Sarah. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Nicole. Bye, Nigel. <laughs>